Fewer journalists have been killed this year than in the last two decades. So far, so good, but there's a downside. More and more reporters are being locked up by governments. The countries that a journalist can work in safely are declining. So is it the message or the messenger that's unsettling so many world leaders? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, this year has seen the lowest number of journalists killed around the world in almost 20 years. The annual review by Reporters Without Borders says most of the 49 reporters killed were covering the wars in Afghanistan, in Syria and Yemen. We'll hear from our guests in just a moment. First, though, some of the main findings from this Paris-based watchdog. At least 941 journalists have been killed over the past 10 years. Now, this year's historically low figure is a shift away from the past 20 years, when around 80 journalists were killed every year. Reporters Without Borders say while fewer journalists are being killed in the field, more are being imprisoned. Reporters Without Borders says 389 journalists were locked up this year. That's an annual rise of 12%. Almost half of them in China, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. At least 57 journalists are currently held hostage, most of them in Syria, Yemen, Iraq and Ukraine. Many others are facing just as much danger in countries that are supposedly in times of peace, like those in South America. Now, before we bring in our guests, let's take a quick look at some of the work of our intrepid reporters. Similar scenes playing out every Friday. What is different now, however, is the escalating tensions between Israel and Hamas. And there have been intensive diplomatic efforts underway by Egypt and the United Nations to try to find a solution. But the situation is so tense that even journalists have become a target. I was just thrown tear gas by the police on purpose. This is what's happening in the middle of a plaza where people have been protesting peacefully. The suicide bombing happens just behind me. Now the authorities have removed the vehicles, but they are saying that they've seen a massive rise in attacks in Kabul and across the country. And so to our guests now, in Paris, we have Sabrina Benoui, head of the Middle East desk at Reporters Without Borders. In Lancaster, in the UK, Robert Gucci is an associate professor at Lancaster University and a former Washington Post contributor. In Ankara, we have Yusuf Kanli, who's director of Media for Democracy programme at Media for Democracy. So a very warm welcome to you all. Sabrina, let me start with you, of course, because you work for uh, Reporters Without Borders. You've just produced this report, which on the face of it is good news. Fewer journalists uh, were killed in 2019. Yes, indeed, it's, apparently it's a good news, but in fact it is not, because um, I would say that now uh, all the authoritarian regimes have to think about more ingenious ways to prevent journalists from doing their job. I would say that uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi has led to several consequences, at least in the MENA region. First, it led journalists to more self-censorship because they don't want to live the same fate, they don't want to be killed just like him, and they don't dare to, um, to talk about sensitive subjects. And then uh, all the governments all the regimes in the area um, have, as I told you, to think about more ingenious ways to prevent them from working. So they don't kill journalists anymore, but they kill journalism instead. That's the message this year, I would say. And uh, let's go to Yusuf then in Ankara, because, of course, Turkey has been identified uh, not only by Reporters Without Borders, but a host of other entities as, as well have identified the Turkish authorities as being among the most prolific detainers of journalists. Uh, what's the situation where you are now in Ankara? Uh, I have to everyone. Indeed, uh, things uh, comparatively or retrospectively appears to be better. 
There are now, as of 15th of uh, December, uh, 121 journalists in Turkish prisons. This includes, of course, uh, 58 uh, sentenced, and the rest are either uh, detained or uh, waiting for trial. Right. Do you recognise, in, in Turkey, are you recognising uh, the symptoms of repressive uh, attitudes towards fr freedom of expression? Uh, Sabrina talked about uh, journalists self-censoring. Uh, she talked about the death of, if not journalists, but the death of journalism. Is that something you recognise in Turkey today? Indeed, that's one area that we keep on uh, stressing in our reports. Uh, we don't have much... A censorship application now in the media uh, because either journalists are uh, self censoring or media ownership has changed so much that the media owners have become pro government. Therefore, people uh, critical of the government cannot find employment opportunity in those outlets. So they, they, they Therefore, haven't got a platform, is what you're saying. Critical voices don't have a platform in Turkey today. They don't have a platform. Right. Uh, indeed, uh, that's one of the aims of our program. We are trying to support uh, freelance journalism. Right. As a consequence of the uh, situation, uh, the Turkish media has, has been uh, in for some time. Right. Um, I'll come to you in a moment, Robert, but first let me go back uh, to Sabrina, because, Sabrina, in the report there is a, uh, uh, a statement which talks about there being less... Uh, armed conflict in the Middle East, and that could account for the fact uh, that there are fewer uh, journalists who've died this year. But um, how do you come to that conclusion? Because uh, there seem to be an awful lot of fighting still in this region, uh, and so much so that many journalists are actually not going there in order to avoid the danger. That's simple. Of course, it's logical since uh, there are less armed conflicts in the region because, for example, in Syria, the government is now uh, controlling um, controlling uh, the majority of the country. But uh, in northern Syria, for example, where Turkey is currently um, leading an offensive, um, well, journalists, especially foreign journalists are leaving the area not to be killed and not to be arrested by uh, the Syrian regime. So this is what we call in Reporters Without Borders a black hole of information. And uh, northern Syria is about to become a black hole of information simply because journalists uh, are leaving the area and now there are only local journalists who are trying to work and who are directly targeted by uh, Turkish, uh, by the Turkish army and even, even by uh, the Syrian security forces. So this is, um, this is a reason why less journalists are being killed, simply because there are less journalists to cover the area. Right, OK. Uh, Robert, then, coming to you, the kind of picture, then, that we've heard from Sabrina uh, and, indeed, from Yusuf in Turkey is not particularly encouraging, is it, despite that, that uh, uh, rather positive-sounding headline. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that fewer journalists are able to work safely in societies? How does the society uh, benefit or otherwise from the absence of critical voices? Well, I think there are two concerns. One is, uh, in the States anyway, what they refer to as a news desert, uh, the, the blackout, if, uh, as, as our other guest had, has mentioned, where there isn't uh, a voice for the voiceless. I mean, that's the, the, the core of what journalism is, is supposed to be, and certainly that allows for society to operate without the involvement uh, of the citizenry. But I think the other concern is, as journalists aren't on the ground, they are refer they're relying on their digital presence. And more and more, uh, the attacks against journalists are going virtual, uh, not just to surveil, but to, uh, to shame, to hack into their information. And that's making the virtual space even more dangerous, not just for the journalists trying to do the work because they don't want to go to where they could be physically harmed, but the citizens, uh, the sources who want to also share information through encryption, 
uh, and other means. And so the the, the war is is you know moving from um, from the physical land to the virtual, uh, and that's a, 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 an even greater threat to democracy as journalists try to to remain safe by trying to do more of their work online. And uh, um, Yusuf in Ankara. Um, I guess there are two major events uh, in the recent Turkish uh, history that might have impacted the uh, landscape in the country, one being the 2016 attempted coup and the other, of course, being the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul. What sort of impact have these two incidents had on the uh, media landscape in Turkey and are, are the two of them are both negative in terms of the way the uh, aftermath has been perceived? You know, when we look at the uh, Turkish mediascape uh, with a wider angle, we may understand that uh, there has been a systematic purge of the critical media, not now, but perhaps uh, since as early as 2012-2013, when, at the time, not the Islamist uh, or the Fethullah uh, terrorist group uh, members, but then the Kemalist or secular uh, journalists were imprisoned. At the time, uh, I remember the number of journalists in prison reaching as high as 170s uh, during those years. Then the climate changed. Then we started seeing uh, the Islamists uh, and, uh, in prison together with the Kurds, the, the Kurdish activists uh, uh, or Kurdish journalists have always been there, unfortunately. Uh, the others changed. Uh, in 2016, uh, with the uh, unfortunate development in the middle of July, we landed up again uh, with a high number of 158 uh, people in prison which right. was uh, real pain. And the death of Khashoggi, uh, I must underline, uh, was the worst of all because a civilian journalist, an individual, was not blatantly murdered, but dismembered, and the body was vanished. And despite that, not only uh, the Saudi uh, government on terror right. went away with it. Um, because we are all responsible. Right, okay. A journalist in daytime Absolutely. enters a yes. conflict and they get uh, and, Rob... and the Saudi government cannot give an account of it. This is Absolutely. nonsense. All right. Robert, coming to you, how uh, responsible uh, are uh, our leaders? Uh, be they democratically elected or otherwise, how responsible are they for the environment, for the climate in which uh, journalism operates or doesn't, as the case may be? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, there's always this tense relationship between uh, officials and journalists, right? Journalists are, are supposedly there to uh, kind of be that watchdog over governments, and governments don't necessarily like that. Uh, so there's a, a natural tension b between there. But we have to remember that these, these governments are, are not only responsible, as I'll say in a second, but benefit a lot from how journalists talk about them. Uh, the idea that there's no such thing as uh, bad publicity, particularly for a journalist or for a politician, I think that's uh, true. But the, so the responsibility there they certainly see is to maintain their own identity in, in journalism, uh, but it's to protect the, the, the governments that, that they have in, in place. Uh, it is there to make sure, they're there to make sure that everybody is safe uh, and that everybody can, can prosper in, in their nation. I mean, this is a pretty simple uh, idea, but yet we see governments not complying with that all around the globe and instead turn into populistic uh, right. terminology about how bad journalists are and undermining trust. Indeed. And Sabrina, we are talking now, aren't we, in the era of uh, fake news and basically uh, a lack of trust, a lot of lack of trust on the part of the public in so many institutions and professions in the world. Um, we've talked about the war zones. What about, uh, because your report has also highlighted what is a, a, a very worrying 
uh, figure, and that is that countries of Latin America that are ostensibly not at war uh, have got uh, the largest number of journalists who've been killed, uh, deliberately targeted uh, outside of the Middle East. Now, what is that to do with? Is that to do with another form of conflict, if not uh, 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 armed conflict? Well, um, in Reporters Without Borders, we think that um, the governments have a double responsibility in uh, those cases. They have a responsibility first because they have failed in uh, their role of protecting journalists because they are they are civilians just like the others. They have a special status, but they are civilians, so they should be protected and not targeted. Some journalists are targeted, are killed, are being killed by governments, by uh, leaders and some others by uh, some militias, for example, in Iraq. So this is the first responsibility. And the second responsibility is that governments are taking part themselves uh, in uh, preventing journalists from doing their job. So I think the situation has to do with um, this res double responsibility of the governments because they have failed it by all means in protecting journalists. Right. And Robert, we, we've talked about uh, the uh, war, uh, the, the conflict zones of the Middle East. We've talked about uh, the, the rather precarious situation in Latin America where so many uh, journalists have been killed. But it, in Europe itself, the most developed and supposedly one of the most safe regions of the world, uh, there was the uh, awful assassination of Daphne Caruana Galicia in Malta in 2017. I mean, what does that tell us about Europe as well in, in, in terms of this uh, context? Well, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the issues and the threats and the actions against journalists do not rise to the level that reports like this can capture. I mean, it's amazing reports like this even exist where you can count and name the people who have been detained or, or, or killed uh, or threatened. But it's this normalization that we can speak ill of, of journalists in violent ways, particularly in the populist governments of the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, and that's spreading throughout Europe and has been for a, a long time. It's a normalization of treatment, removing credentials, uh, threatening people, detaining uh, for even minutes, um, uh, that those those things don't get recorded and those things do not make their way up to this report. So I think the, the uh, real concern here is what's happening on the ground and the local level that is normalizing this type of process for these greater instances to, to happen without, without much uh, question other than from, from outside sources such as uh, this organization, Reporters Without, Without Borders. Right. And, and Sabrina, coming back to Latin America, because, of course, um, the situation in Brazil, for instance, was a significant topic where many environmental uh, journalists found themselves at odds with the at odds with the prevailing views of the government, and therefore they seem to have ended up being treated uh, by government supporters almost as if they were activists. Can you tell us a bit more about how the Amazon fires and the coverage of that uh, really sort of polarized the uh, community in Brazil? Well. In Latin America and all over the world, journalists are, have a tendency to be uh, considered as, well, spies or activists. This is a very common accusation, uh, accusation towards journalists. And this is the case, as I told you, all around the world. And it is part of a dangerous climate uh, atmosphere against journalists that uh, governments are taking part in. Uh, it is also the case in Israel, for example, of the prime minister uh, can name directly one journalist because he has uh, conducted an investigation about him. And now this journalist, uh, whose name is Guy Peleg, has to uh, walk in the street with a bodyguard. So they are taking part in this dangerous, very dangerous and irres irresponsible uh, atmosphere against journalists because they are considered um, as activists and um, generally they say that they are making propaganda or they are um, leftist, uh, things like that. So, you know, they are not um, considered as only journalists, which is only the fact of uh, providing information of, 
for the public's interest. Right. Um, uh, Sabrina, uh, do you think that we should be uh, encouraged by the fact that governments and their supporters are less likely, perhaps, to kill uh, a, a journalist and more likely uh, to lock up, to detain? I'm, I'm thinking, perhaps, of Egypt, uh, where the crackdown on independent voices, critical voices even, uh, continues today. And it is. Egypt is one of the most... Uh, one of the most prolific when it comes to detaining journalists? No, it is not a positive sign at all because it's one of the more ingenious ways that I told you about uh, earlier during the show. Um, indeed, Egypt is one of the biggest dealers of journalists in the world with Saudi Arabia and China, and it is a systematic practice to um, make journalists stop working as journalists. It's as simple as that. And um, the most common charges against journalists are disseminating false news or uh, supporting a terrorist group. And even there's a new accusation against them, which is the misuse of social media, which is a very new accusation and uh, very dangerous, in fact, because you can jail anyone uh, in the basis of this uh, charge. And they are not only uh, jailing journalists, they are also threatening them. Uh, it is the case in Iraq with the latest uh, protests that are occurring now. Uh, many, many militias are threatening journalists. Uh, now journalists are becoming afraid of only reporting and covering the demonstrations because they can be killed or kidnapped by any, any terrorist group or militia in the country. And I will also uh, talk about the responsibility of the Iraqi state, uh, which has cut the internet uh, since the beginning of the protest. And it is a way to prevent people from having a transparent and free access of the information. They cannot even share the videos of the security forces uh, who are uh, opening the right. fire against uh, the civilians. Um uh, Robert, let, let's come to you. We can't uh, 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 leave this conversation, can we, without mentioning President Trump and the kind of um, vitriol that he's levelled pretty much consistent, consistently since he came to power in 2017, the vitriol that he's levelled against the media in the United States and beyond, it's got to be said. Um, has that mud stuck in terms of the public relationship with the media and, and its level of trust? Well, we already knew that there were uh, distinct uh, separations between the press and the people, particularly in, in the United States. Uh, we knew that based upon how journalists talked about the affairs of the day and how the average citizen also experienced those everyday events. They, they were quite different. But this sort of speech that is calling the press the enemy of the people, which has moved itself over uh, borders and over continents, uh, is, again, a, a very dangerous uh, normalization of violence against uh, citizens, uh, against democracy. Um, sometimes it's taken as a joke, but as we're seeing with mis- and disinformation online, there is a rallying cry for people to take out uh, people who are not Trump supporters and certainly to take out the journalists who are telling, uh, telling either truths or facts uh, or other positions. Uh, it's a very dangerous rhetoric that we'll, uh, we'll see if he gets a second term, how, if, if it'll lighten up or if it's just going to get worse. We, we don't know. Uh, but it, it, it will be uh, kind of scary to watch if it, if it gets much worse. All right. Thank you all very much indeed. Sabrina Benoui in Paris, Robert Gucci in Lancaster in England, and Yusuf Kanli in Ankara. Turkey. Thank you all very much indeed. And as ever, thank you for watching the programme. You can see it again anytime you like by going to the website aljazeera.com. Should you want more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. There's always the Twitter sphere as well. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Martine Dennis from the whole team here in Doha. It's bye for now.